Whatever he says. I don't know. Alright, I'll, I'll get to it. Anybody hear me? <laughs> anybody? Anybody hear me? Again, just to repeat yourself long, if I could have college students, young professionals, and high schools in the front, inshallah. Young professionals means under the age of 30. After 30, you're not young anymore. Four years and such, you're 35? You fit in that category, right? Being able to show forgiveness when you're angry, being able to show mercy 
when you're angry, uh, seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and showing mercy to people at the very moment that you're angry so that you can seek the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We take those three things together, inshallah ta'ala, that's really what I want to talk about tonight because what is the biggest factor that stops the person? This is guilt, this is the thing that's guilty in all three of these situations. There's a connecting factor here. What will stop a person from receiving advice? What will stop what will cause a person to get angry and get offended easily? And what will cause a person to not be willing to forgive? There is one factor that it really gets it boils down to this. Arrogance, yeah. yeah. ego. That's pretty good, mashallah. I didn't think you guys would get that. Right? Ego. Think about it. A person who has a really, really big ego doesn't want people to correct them, doesn't want people to give him advice. A person who has a, a really big ego, you know, who's got, who has a lot of pride, does not like people telling him what to do, does not like people advising him. Then at the same time, when people do advise him and do try to correct him, and in general, what does it usually cause? What does it usually, what usually happens as a result? He gets angry, right? Then when he gets angry, he stomps his feet and he screams in the heat and he talks about how awesome he is and stuff like that for a day or two or three days and how that person doesn't have the right to talk to me that way and, and do that to me because I'm this and I'm that and he's this and he's that and who does he think he is? There you go, you've got ego again. He doesn't want to forgive, right? He won't let it go because he thinks he's so... he, he, he sees himself in such a high manner that he's not able to tolerate someone stepping on his toes. Who does this peasant think he is, right? You know, for talking to me that way. You know, and I'm not going to let that go because I'm this and he's that, right? Ego is guilty in all of these things. Now the problem with that, I'm not accusing you guys of anything, but this is, ego is one of those things that is, that, that manifests itself at different times of your life in different ways, right? Now, the time when you'll be most egotistical is at that college age to young professional age. All you guys in the front row. I'm not accusing any of you having an ego at all. I'm just saying. I'm saying that's the time when you're most susceptible to it. That's the time when you really are on your nerves all the time. When you don't want people to talk to you in a certain way. When you feel like everyone's being degraded towards you. If someone tries to give you some advice, I'm a grown man, who does he think he is? Right? If some, you know, that's when you really have that issue. That's when, it, when, when things really get on your nerves. And that's usually when you're tempered is really, really, really bad, especially if you weren't beaten enough as a child. Okay? I'm, I'm being straight up. If you weren't beaten enough as a child, then you're probably going to be more violent tougher. I'm not advocating abusing your children, but you can pop them on the wrist every once in a while. Keep them humble. Right? <laughs> For the parents. But if you weren't abused as a child, <laughs> I'm sorry, if you weren't disciplined as a child, then usually at this age, that ego really comes forward. That, that's when you really see those signs. You know, because of the lack of discipline, that's when a person just blows up on it, on everything. Alright? And then again, you don't want to let anything go. Right? Then when you get older, your ego becomes manifest in a different way. You know, when someone tries to, when someone does something that's different from you, or when someone corrects you, he's just a kid. You know, I've been around for 40 years longer than he has. I saw his diapers get changed, all that stuff comes forward. You know, like, who does he think he is? You know, I, I, you know, I gave birth to you. Who do you think you are to try to tell me about how to be a better Muslim and those types of things? That's when ego manifests itself in a different form. And of course, people get you know more testy at that age also, the older that they get in those types of things. The point is, is that ego is ego is that main factor. And ironically, the Prophet وسلم, he said, and this is something that's really hard for people to digest. A lot of times people ask me, you know, this question, like, is this hadith for real? How could there be such a hadith? You know, that no person will enter Jannah with an Adam's worth of pride in his heart. Not even an Adam's worth of pride in his heart. Why? Because pride will stop you from accepting advice. It will stop you from surrounding people, surrounding yourself with people who will give you advice. It will make you less receptive to advice. You'll get angry very quickly because of your pride. And then you'll degrade the person that you had a dispute with and you will refuse to forgive that person because of that pride. All of that comes from pride. Now the ultimate, the ultimate, you know, the peak of pride is what? What does kibir mean in this, in this hadith? What did the Prophet Sallallahu say it means in this hadith? Anyone remember that? Two things. Only you. Anybody? It's 
not little boy's name. <laughs> I'm hearing names. I'm sorry. My daughter and my daughter. Uh, two things. What are they? All right. One of them is when you're so full of pride that you won't even accept something from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala in the Quran and the Sunnah. Right? Someone corrects you according to the Quran and Sunnah. Someone says, "Look, you're doing something wrong." You say, "No, I'm not doing anything wrong. Don't judge me." Blah 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 blah. What's your proof? Oh, it says here in the Quran, or it says this hadith, oh, I'm not going to worry about all that, I'm not going to accept that. That's the ultimate manifestation of pride. When you're not even willing to accept something from the Quran, listen, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when even your creator is not good enough for you, when even your creator has to logically convince you to do things. The second one, does anyone remember? Ghamtul Nas, when you start to look down on people. Now here's the thing, looking down on people, here's how we usually define it, in a very naive manner. Usually when we think of looking down on people, it's, you know, I'm wearing a brand new pair of Jordans or whatever it is, you know, I'm wearing a brand new pair of shoes, that guy's wearing sandals from the Middle East that look like they, they cost $5, I'm better than him. That's not what pride, that's not what this is talking about. That's when you think you're better than somebody. When you, when you think you're better than somebody. And you know what's sad? Usually what falls into that category of naps, the first people that usually fall into it are your parents. <laughs> because at one point in your life, you really think you're better than your parents. You really think you have a better understanding than you know? them. You really think you know better. You really think that they're just insane and senile at one point in your life. When they're not actually insane and senile. Right? They're still 50 years old. That's one point of your life. Then it comes into this, you know, the standpoint when you think, or when you have a, when you conceive a religious type of arrogance, I'm a better Muslim than him. I'm a better Muslim than her. You know, who does that guy think he is? That guy has a girlfriend. I'm a better Muslim than him. Who does that sister think she is? She doesn't wear hijab. I'm a better Muslim than, that, than her. You might be practicing something that she should be practicing. You might be doing something that he should be doing. Or you might be not doing something that he is doing. But at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has never given you the right to say to yourself that you're a better Muslim than that person. That you're better than that person. That's when it gets really, 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 really bad. Now here's the thing. Identifying pride, identifying that ego, and getting rid of it has a lot of practical steps that the Prophet taught us, that we find in the books of, of Tuskegee and how to purify ourselves, how to get rid of that stuff, because that stuff can kill you spiritually. Pride can kill you spiritually, because you'll never acknowledge your mistakes. You'll say things to people that you will regret for the rest of your life, and you might meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a disbeliever because you rejected something from the Qur'an and the Sunnah because you thought you knew better. You, you put yourself above even the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Now in our situation, here's the problem. And I want to take all three last things, all three last khutbas, and bundle them up and, and specifically how we can act upon this as youth. Number one, being able to control your temper, humbling yourself, Knowing that you're not all that. Seriously, you're not all that. I'm not all that. If someone comes to you and tries to help you, if someone comes to you and corrects you, if someone crosses you, don't take that as something that you know that should anger you. Don't take that as something that should, you know, that, that will stir up your ego. Use that. Use that. Even if they're insulting, even if they're rude, even if they're offensive. Let me tell you why. Sometimes you're gonna walk into the message, you might be dressed in a certain way, and some uncle's gonna call you out on that. And they might do it in a very un-Islamic manner. So I'm not justifying what they're doing. They have to face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with their way, and you've got, to, you've got to face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with your sin. And sometimes, what will we do? You're not going to listen to one bit of what that person said because of the way that he said it. He's rude. Who does he think he is? He thinks he's better than me. He thinks my parents didn't raise me right. But he told you to do something that was right. At the end of the day, he told you to do something that you should be doing, or he, or he tried to correct something about you Try to take the benefit from what he said to you. Yeah, he's wrong. Yes, the way he said it was wrong. He shouldn't have approached you about it in that way. But try to find the benefit in that. Try to find the advantage of that. Try to find what in there that might be truth. You know, that's extremely important. Because there is something about, there's a reason why it was said to you and it wasn't said to somebody else. And if it's something from the Qur'an the Sunnah, don't let your ego stop you from accepting that. The other thing, again, it's one thing to surround yourself with people who will give you advice and people that will try to correct you. Whenever your friend calls you out, I'm talking about your friends now, when your friend calls you out, 
and he called you up in a rough manner. And again, the type of people that you want to have around you, the type of relationship that you want to have is, is what I said two weeks ago, with Abu Bakr and Umar had. Where if one of them messes up, when Umar messes up, Abu Bakr grabs him by the beard, not many of you have beards, but grabs him by the beard, pulls him down, and tells him to watch himself. Because they trusted each other. They understood that each one was watching the other person's back. They understood that they weren't just leading each other to hellfire for the sake of you know, winning a popularity contest, for the sake of getting along with everybody. They watched each other's backs, and they understood that. So whenever your friend comes to you to correct you, when someone calls you out on your sin, try to recognize the intention of that person. Try to see good in what that person is trying to do. Try to see some benefit from that. And then the third thing, and this is where it really comes down to, your parents. Your parents. Now, let me put you all in this scenario. If right now, my baby name was downstairs, and she wanted a piece of, and I don't even want to say the word, but I'm going to say it really low. She wanted a piece, because if I say it now, she'll start screaming for it, right? And, if, and if, if she wanted a piece of that, and I said no, and I put it in my pocket, and I said no, and she started throwing a tantrum, what is everyone in here going to think? Is, everyone, is anyone going to actually think that she's right? I know she's cute, but is she right? Or am I right? Who's right? It's okay, she doesn't understand you yet. You can point to me at least, you don't want to get her on your bad side. Who was right and who was wrong in that situation? You're right. I was right, she was wrong. Right? I was trying to watch out, but I can't sit her down and explain to her what candy does to her teeth yet. <laughs> and explain to her that sugar is not good for her because it might keep her up awake at night. I can't do that. Right? She doesn't get that yet. Meaning she still hasn't reached the level of maturity. Babies still have not reached that level of maturity. Children still have not reached that level of maturity. She gets a little bit older, whenever a child gets a little bit older, they're at Celebration Station, well Celebration Station is close here, they're at Chuck E. Cheese, or they're at somewhere, you know, and parents come and say it's time to go home, and they start throwing their tantrum, and this place is about to close in two minutes anyway, and you've been staying there for four hours, Who's right and who's wrong? The parents for spending their money trying to give their kid a good time on Eid, or the kids for crying and throwing a tantrum and, and going off on their parents for not letting them stay until the time, you know, until closing time. The parents were right. But that kid still hasn't reached the level of maturity where they can understand that yet. Now let me tell you why a lot of us are still at that same level of maturity at the age of 20 years old. Here's the reason why. Because the candy now is the car. Candy now is not letting you leave your house, you know, to go out at this time of the night. It's not letting you do what you want to do at this time. It's not, you know, it's calling you out on this certain action that you're doing. The only thing is, you're not talking about, you know, skittles anymore. You're talking about something much bigger. But the concept is still there. Your parents still want what's best for you. They're still doing things. They're still restraining you. And let me tell you something. The greatest favor that my dad ever did was beating the trash out of me whenever I crossed my limits. How many of you did that? Seriously. Because I understood later on in life, he really did that because he loved me. He really did that because he loved me. There was a reason for that. Sometimes I used to think, a lot of people think this, how come my dad is stricter than other people's dad? How come this kid gets to get spoiled right and do what he wants, even in college? Right? Because trust me, some people in college have the minds of a 10 year old. You know, how come this kid gets whatever he wants, but I don't get any of that? How come I have to go through this struggle? You really appreciate that once you reach that maturity level, just like the kid understands that whenever they're not buck to at the age of five because of the candy that they used to eat. You know, thanks for holding that away from me. You start to get these things later on in life. The problem is, is that some people take a really, really, really long time to understand who really cares for them and who really loves them. So instead of looking for those people who love them, instead of looking for those people, instead of receiving that advice, instead of taking things, you know, with, 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 the, with the appropriate response, you go and you surround yourself with people that accept you as a failure. And all you want is flattery. All you want is people to tell you that you're doing the right thing. All you want is passive friends, who the Prophet ﷺ called mute devils, who on the day of judgment will be guilty of the same crime as the one who committed the sin. Those people will be in the same level of hell for not correcting them. Passes. Just letting it go. Let everything go. I'm not going to say anything. You don't. That's what we want. We want people to make us feel good. We want flattery around us all the time. All the time. But now let's go to another category. This is where this book accounts. 
Was this khutbah about showing compassion and mercy when the other person is right or when the other person is wrong? When the other person is wrong. Okay, now parents, you can close your ears right now, please. Parents, you should not be here in the first place. You can close your ears. Sometimes your parents are wrong. Sometimes your parents really do not make the right calls. Okay, and sometimes they really say things that, you know what, maybe they're not right. Maybe it's, maybe it's true. It's not the norm, by the way. The norm is that you're wrong and you're not understanding life because you're younger. You haven't gotten it yet. Every once in a while though, and I have to be diplomatic and politically correct, every once in a while, the parents will make a mistake. People that love you and people that care about you, they're going to advise you in the wrong way. They're going to be too harsh with you or they're going to say something they shouldn't have said. They're going to personally offend you. Don't do away with all of their good and all of their intentions and all of the times that you were wrong because they messed up that one time. That's so important to understand. You know, maybe right now you don't face that as much, but whenever, you, especially whenever you start getting into, you know, your professional careers and things of that sort, matters of marriage, matters of family, these types of things, sometimes your parents are really going to say things that are going to upset you. And they might actually be wrong. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not make them infallible, Allah did not make you infallible. 99% of the time you're wrong, 1% of the time they're wrong. Sometimes you're going to have your older brother, you're going to have that friend who cares about you, and he's going to come to you and he's going to call you out. Don't do away with all of the good, because he made you upset that time because he did something wrong. Maybe he did do something wrong. Maybe he said something wrong. Maybe he overstepped his boundaries. But you know what? Don't do away with everything. Show some mercy. Be forgiving towards them, towards them. Because at the end of the day, you've got to be able to recognize the people that care about you in life. And you've got to be able to recognize the people that are actually, you know, just really, you know, building you a great new hellfire at this point. Putting you in hellfire for the rest of your life, for the rest of your existence, because they want to be on good terms with you. You've got to be able to recognize the good intentions of people who mess up. That's the first thing. The second thing, and inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to end with that, but I'm going to go to the video. The second thing, you know, a lot of people are going to offend you because of your Islam. And the Islamophobia is probably only going to get worse. Let me, let me ask you this question, and be honest, you don't have to give me the religious answer. If you're, if you're at a restaurant, and you can tell, without a doubt, that the waitress is offending you because you're Muslim, what do you do? Or if you're at school and your teacher said a derogatory remark towards you, what do you do? Complain, right? Right? Throw a fit. Get the supervisor, get the manager at the restaurant, tell the dean of the college, whatever it is, go after them, say, I want this person fired, I don't want them here, you're not going to get my business anymore if you're in school, I want this teacher fired, I want this professor fired. You know, I want, I, want, I want this and I want that and I want this. You're going, a lot, most of us will do that. Right? Most of us will do that. Or some ignorant fool walks up to you in Walmart or somewhere else and says something derogatory towards you because you're a Muslim. You're going to talk back. You're going to curse back. You're going to fight back. And you know what? Shaitan will probably be deluding you into thinking that that's the right thing to do. Especially sisters who wear hijab. Shaitan will probably delude you into thinking the right thing to do is to yell back and scream back and show the same filthy manners that they show towards you. But at the end of the day, what good was achieved by that? At the end of the day, what good was achieved by that? That person's stereotypes of Islam were reinforced. The only reason I'm saying this is because they're going to face it at one point in your life. It's only, it, it might even get worse, right? The elections are coming up. We're going to hear a lot more of that, right? It might only get worse. So then we go back, and this is something in the Qur'an, again, the ayat that we spoke about today, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that those people who, whenever they are facing oppression, young tasirun, they put themselves in a position to defend themselves. But whenever they're in that possession, or position where they could take revenge, what do they do instead? I'm going to let you go on that. I'm going to forgive you. They put themselves in a position of dignity where they can respond, where they can defend themselves. So for example, I'm going to give you two, two cases, right? 
And some of you guys might have faced this situation too. Some of you when you go to college, you might face this too. One guy goes to the goes to the office, goes to the dean, and demands that the professor gets fired. And the professor does get fired. Threatens to bring care, ACLU, all these civil liberties unions, stuff like that. Ten, you know, threatens to bring all that to get that person fired. That person gets fired. The other one demands an apology, and then and then says, you know what? I don't want that person to get punished. I don't want you to get punished. I just want you to understand that what you said was wrong. These are two situations that I know that happened. Right? One of these took place at NYU, New York University. Right? You know that that professor became Muslim? I'm serious. That professor actually became Muslim later on. That professor called the sister a raghead in class, right, in front of everyone. That sister, young Placido, she went to the department, she complained. The department was about to fire the professor. She said, while all this was going on, all this was she said, I don't want him fired, I just want him to understand that what he did was wrong. My religion teaches me to show mercy. That person became Muslim. Right? SubhanAllah, understand when it's better to, to show mercy. Put yourself in a position where you can defend yourself. You can't exercise that same, you can't do the same thing back, but you don't do it. You show the beauty of your religion. But the most important thing that I want you to take from all of this, trust me, your parents, your parents, your parents. Even whenever they mess up, they're messing up with good intentions. They want what's best for you. You have to be able to understand that. Otherwise, you're just like the two-year-old who's trying to not can. You're the same way as that two-year-old. You're just as immature and just as dumb as that two-year-old. You haven't reached the level where you really understand things yet. You have to be able to understand, and you have to show mercy and love to them at all times, and the people in your life that care about you. If you're not willing to show those people in your life, you know, I'm, I'm gonna, seriously, uh, I remember growing up, my brother was, was terrible with me. Seriously, terrible. I mean, really, really, really harsh. Four and a half years older, used to drive me insane my entire life. Even whenever I was going to study Islam, he tried to deter me from that. He was like, dude, you're not going to be able to find a job. You're never going to make money. You're never going to be a success in life. Why don't you stick with this? Why don't you stick with that? Some of those conversations got really, really, really nasty. I forgave him. You know why? Because I knew he was actually saying that out of love for me. He was wrong. How many of he was wrong? Thank God I'm not living on a street like he said I would be. Right? How many of he was wrong? But I really forgave him for that. And I, and I, loved, I loved him for that because I knew he meant well with that. He meant well with that. He said those things because he cared about me. Right? So he was wrong, but he said them because he cared about me. And you've got to be able to recognize that in your life. When people say things to you, when people are harsh with you because they love you, because they want better, what's best for you, don't ever allow your ego to kick in. Because your ego will throw you into hell face first. Your ego will ruin you. And so inshallah ta'ala, before I show the video, this is going to be my new thing. I'm going to, call, I'm going to bring one person up to just kind of reflect for a few minutes. So today, Suhaim. Assalamu alaikum. Well, uh, I don't know what's left to be said. Of course, I'm pretty much covered everything. But I mean, I just, I guess, I can give some of my experiences that I've had like, with my parents and with other people. And I guess, really, right now, I'm trying to understand like the things that my parents did to protect me. Things that my parents did to protect me when I was younger. I mean, and of course, when I was younger, my parents didn't let me play video games or watch a lot of TV. I was really upset, right? I mean, like, like, I'd be like, oh, all these other people are watching TV, like all my friends from school. And, but now I realize that because my mother and my father only allowed me to do things in moderation, they actually protected me. And that's why I'm, mean, alhamdulillah, I'm more successful than I would have been if they hadn't limited, like, Payment in general. And I mean, like Sheikh Omar said about uh, pride is a terrible thing. I think even uh, Sheikh Hussain, when he came a couple of years back, he told us that uh, he just he pretty much like outlined it for us. He told us how bad pride was. He said, like, the same thing as Sheikh Omar said that if somebody comes up to you and insults you, but like in their statements, there is like one good thing or one little bit of advice, you have to take that one thing and like sort of capitalize on it, like improve yourself whenever you can, inshallah. And uh, I think, pretty interesting story. Uh, the other day, 
Well, every now and again, like in eyelash, I start to go into my mother's arm. So she called me downstairs one day and she told me, like, to, if, if possible, to take that eyelash out. So she gave me a mirror and a pair of tweezers, and I went, and like on the first try, I managed to pluck the eyelash out. But my mother insisted that I hadn't taken it out, because her eye was still irritating her. And I started to get like all defensive, because I knew that I had taken that eyelash out. And I mean, it sort of escalated a little bit to the point that like, we were almost like, I guess, uh, almost shouting at each other. Not exactly shouting, almost shouting. And then eventually I walked away, I was pretty upset. But later on, my mom called me and she said, You got it out, but I forgive you. And I realized that, I mean, I needed my mother's forgiveness more than she needed my forgiveness, right? Because I was wrong to get angry at my mother, to shout at my mother almost. Right? Just interesting experiences, like now that I look back in hindsight, I realized I was wrong, not my mother. Uh, what else? Uh, friends, friends. I mean, alhamdulillah. Great uh, friends here, right? All you guys got my back. If I did something wrong, I expect you guys to come up and tell me what I'm doing wrong. Uh, I mean, and we need that. Like, right now, um, a lot of us are really close, we're all friends, alhamdulillah. So we need to like, watch each other's backs and make sure that none of us, inshallah, become proud of people or uh, like, allow our egos to like, get ahead of us and just protect each other, inshallah. That's all I have to say. Salaam. Salaam. Somebody hit the mic switch. Because I don't know if it was awesome. So this is, uh, I want to mention this to you guys, but I didn't actually get a chance to show it to you because the clip didn't download. So this is commercial. I, I told you guys the story, but you can watch it. It's a, it's a video. It's a clip. Um, it's in uh, some other language. I don't know what the other language is, but there's English subtitles, so you can read the subtitles in Chalk Time and follow along. Um, about a man sitting with his son and things of that sort. So there's a little part like in the middle where there's some, some instruments. I'm going to pull the microphone away and put it back in Chalk. Just in case some of you do understand that language. Thank you. 